everybody and welcome to another episode of Reluctant Hero podcast. This podcast has been designed to inspire people and bring them more clarity and more hope into the accomplishment of their own goals because we're all heroes on our own hero's journey and sometimes we find ourselves reluctant in some areas. And so I have been creating this podcast and interviewing people to showcase the stories of how others have encountered reluctance and encountered challenges and have overcome that and transcended those barriers. And so in this episode, we have guest Dave from Joera Organics, and uh, that is a very interesting company. And I'll let him introduce more about that because I want to go more deeply into this concept of agriculture and what the future is for us as a humanity in general. So, Dave, please introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, a pre- it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Dave, Dave Banford. I'm uh, the founder of Joe Organics, um, and we look after um, agrotechnology all over the world from uh, Africa to South Africa to Central Africa is our primarily focus. So we're trying to bring technology and uh, upgraded systems to a larger portion of the planet. Wow, that is incredible and such a relevant subject matter and such a relevant need. How did you start it in this business of agriculture? Well, it was kind of uh, something I enjoyed doing. I enjoyed growing my own stuff in our own yard. And uh, I'm I'm electrical and an electrical engineer by trade. So then I started, um, I guess, by overwhelming to make things uh, more efficient in process and uh, That led me down the hole to automating things in uh, the agricultural industry. So uh, I I got involved with automation and then I ended up getting uh, involved with a friend of mine from Impilo Projects out of Africa. And they were working on facilities in Holland uh, to develop Holland technology. So we ended up getting, I started working with a team with them. He was an HVAC engineer. We had some other guys. I was the electrical engineer. And we started putting stuff together and it really started out to be a hobby more than anything. And then it kind of spiraled into uh, more of a need uh, as as the industry grew and 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 got more complicated over the years so wow that yeah. is a fascinating beginning from engineering to now leading a company and um can you tell a little bit more about where you came from and where you ended up as a result of this journey well it started out as a hobby in canada in ontario canada and it's literally taken me all over the world and again, it's just, I guess when you're something, when you're, when you enjoy doing something, it's not really work, right? So it wasn't, I wasn't like I was chasing a, a nine to five paycheck. It was just like, oh, there's a need in that. And then as things progressed, the the, the funds came in and, and on the back end, but it was never, it never ended up being an objective of mine to go down this path. So how I really got here, I'm not really sure. It kind of happened by fluke and it just kind of here I am. <laughs> and we just keep moving on with it. Wow, that is incredible because I hear all the time how if you follow your passion, if you follow your excitement, then the road will lead you into the specific direction where you need to end up going. And if you're not really attached to where you're going to end up, but just following that excitement and those projects, then you will end up in the exactly right place where you need to be to fulfill some kind of need. And that also reminds me of the quote is that, opportunity exists there where responsibility has been abdicated, which is in your case is a clear example of that need. So can you talk a little bit more about what that need is right now? Most people nowadays have kind of forgotten about agricultural and it's really based more on census data. Like it makes a lot more sense if you relate it to census data because The majority of farmers now are baby boomers and are aging. So as they become older and they can't look after the farms, most of the time their children or grandchildren aren't interested in taking over the farm. So it's it's creating a massive hole in the industry. And since most uh, Gen Ys and Gen Zs and even a good percentage of Gen Xers are just aren't really interested in agricultural. So 
since there's the demand's not changing because there's the people still here, right? So the supply and demand ratio is extremely high. Or sorry, the demand ratio is high, but the supply is, is falling off a cliff. So they're forcing automation pretty hard in that industry just to make up for the lack of labor and farms. So technology is really, in order to keep up with that demand, it, if you can't get the people, the only way you can do is automate it, right? So... That is such a good point to make that as generations are shifting, I have seen personally in my life, because I live in the rural area right now, and I have neighbors who still have cows and still have fields, and they are old. And there are no new people, no younger people are coming in to replace them. So what you are talking about is very relevant, and we probably have forgotten about it because we've been so focused on politics. We have been focused on the world climate, but we have been focused on technology and emergence of AI that I think everybody has forgotten that there is this gap that is growing. And what are we going to do in 10 years? time that's a very good question and, and that's what we're what we're trying to drive forward and, and make things more efficient so you know we try to install 10 by 30 foot greenhouses uh automated watering systems um auto automated like uh fertilizer injector systems temperature with like depending on the climate we're in and where we are uh, depends on the heating or cooling systems we'll use uh, but then we have the ability to remote monitor and run these from all over the world, right? So from a central server that we have, so we can, we don't have to have such the demand for uh, skilled labor because that's a, it's an issue for us trying to find skilled labor in that industry that are people that are interested, but we have been able to bridge the gap with the younger people more with the technology side of it that we find that if we, if you just go and say, hey, we're in agriculture or whatever, people are like, oh, you guys are poor. Like they think of like a horse and buggy or a donkey. Like, I don't know what they think, but it's they're like it's a, in their mind. It's like it's a horrible job. Right. But it's it's really not right. You're outside. You have your freedom. You can kind of come and go. You're not stuck to an office desk. It's a very rewarding industry. You know what I mean? If you enjoy that type of thing. Yeah, it is. A, it's a good point. Why do you think people have this misconception about agriculture? And why is everybody kind of gravitating more towards urban environment, even though at the same time, they want to be free, they want to be in nature? What do you think is the disconnect in the perception? Do we need like a new word for agriculture? Is it all beliefs that come from the past? Yeah, I think there's kind of a, a stigmatism attached with agricultural where it's more traditional, where you kind of in their in their mind they think it's like, you know, we get married, have kids, sit down, have a farm, you'll work all day. It's very it's very labor intensive. These very traditional stigmatisms behind that, and then when you have conversations with millennials and Gen Zs, that's like, that's kind of the exact opposite of their uh, character and their belief system, which is completely contrary to some of ours being from a different generation. They value more. They don't really value the traditional mindset of, oh, I got to go to college, university, get a job, stay in this place, get a house, get married, have kids. This whole uh, traditional mantra is just not really them. They they value more experiences and travel, staying in a smaller place. They'd rather rent you know, and travel around from different places as opposed to a buying a place. So it's just a different mentality. It's just a matter of the, the agricultural industry has a, done a poor job at trying to connect those dots. And that's something we're trying to work on because we don't always need full-time people, right? Like so sometimes we, we need maybe our core staff, but maybe there's there's people that, that do want to travel and have different experiences in a modern agricultural industry, right? Where they could come and get experience or, you know, they come down and do a training thing or something like that. We're working on trying to set some of that up with some of the governments down here. So then we could offer this, that, that same thing, but that experience, that experience aspect that they're kind of looking for and maybe try to inspire it that way from coming around the back end, I suppose. Yeah, that's a good point. And also it's worth mentioning that it's possible the millennials have been disillusioned with this whole prospect of being able to have education, have a job, have a stable income, because it's not been visibly possible for them to actually even afford 
things that the previous generation could easily afford. The things have exponentially increased in, in price. And so a lot of millennials and Gen Zs have not been able to experience the same way of living as the previous generation has. So they decided, okay, well, if we can't, then we might as well travel and we might as well get the best out of their life because we cannot do what the parents uh, are and the previous generation did. You can't really blame them for thinking that, you know what I mean? If you if you able to think about their lives through their shoes and what they saw growing up from the traditional people. So, you know, like when I was like, I'm a little older. So when I grew up, like my mom stayed at home, that was just kind of the way it was. But now, like, say, like my generation and just a little bit older than I am. But, but, but after the baby boomers, both parents are working. They're never home. They're, they, they go to school and and then they get raised by a babysitter right like there's no structure there they see their parents fighting and struggling having to make payments oh and now it's getting worse and worse because of you know everything the cost of everything's going up so they they from the time they grew born and grew up all they seen was their parents struggle and be complicated and disconnected from the relationship from like their mother father relationship because they're working both time if you were looking at this for the majority of your life you'd be like why the hell would I want to do that? You know what I mean? Like, that's a horrible life. Like, I don't want to live the rest of my life. So if you if, if you think about it, it's understandable why they're like, well, I'm not going to go down that road because I that's all I've seen my whole life. So they want something different. Again, like, this is not new. Every time we have large generational shifts, there's, there's always a big disconnect between the new and the old. And we're going through it again. It's just, I think people it's been so good for so long because the baby boomers as was the largest generation in history of mankind. And everybody kind of in between is kind of like negligible and the millennial and Gen Z's and Gen Y's is really literally the next largest generation in the history of mankind on planet earth. So there's such a drastic, they've kind of like went from the baby boomers to here. So it, it's at extremes at the end of the, like it's a full extremes at the end of the scale. So this is where I find businesses disconnect a lot, right? Because they're still trying to do business with this, but that's basically falling off a cliff, right? And this is the majority of planet Earth now, right now. And and there's very few people, or very few industries. I'm like, wait a minute, maybe we should shift focus on the next largest generation in the history of population of planet Earth, right? Like we yeah. should, maybe we don't, maybe we don't necessarily agree or have the same value propositions as them. But we should still be able to separate ourselves and at least listen to them, regardless of our own opinion as business owners. It's not about us as a business owner. It's just about our clients and and our pe and our people that we're trying to do business with. So we have to listen to what they want and you know what's inspiring them. What do they want? What again? I always say to my people: people don't buy products; they buy solutions. Listen to what they're asking for, and they will tell you what they want and supply them a solution. Right? That's my mindset. That is such an incredible point because, yes, we cannot blame the the younger generation for what they are going through. And not only that, but look at what we are actually dealing with in the world. There's this controversy about the climate. The climate is changing, obviously. The oceans are polluted because we have let it go. There's all kinds of conflicts happening based on the agricultural methods that have been used in the past that a lot of people objected to uh, like the raising of the animals and the, the how that has been done then there also been pollutants that have been used in growing of the food that's also under inspection people don't agree with that in addition to that there is a manufacturing of the food that has been happening for many years now that has resulted in a lot of health issues so we're looking at that and still trying to move into the new world, but have no idea kind of how to do that. It's it's a very confusing world right now. It is, and you just kind of have to break it down. And instead of being so judgmental, it's like, okay, why and how did we get here? Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not advocating that what, what they're doing in traditional agricultural over the last years and in, in, in monocrop farming and everything is, is uh, the best way to do things. But if you look at why and how we got to that stage, I can understand why we ended up here. You know what I mean? It just it just didn't be like there wasn't no malicious intent, really, where it's like, hey, we're going to go and do all this and, and, and destroy the ground and, and poison a bunch of people like that. Like, that's not that's not the way it, it evolved. And that's kind of where we got to. 
so again, as the, the world's largest pop, the baby boomers came in, and then they started, the millennials and all them started coming, the Gen Xers and the millennials started coming, there's this huge population boom, right? So now we're kind of like at a point now where we have two of the largest populations and kind of coexisting in a very short period of time in history. But that put such a demand on the agricultural industry to ramp up in, if you look at a macro scale, like a longer time frame, in like the shortest period of history on in it's it's unconceivable how how fast that evolved and when things evolve that fast obviously details and things get overlooked because the main objective and main focus is output right and sometimes on that drive to output we overlook things obviously you know even when you're in a rush you know what i mean you got to get up in the morning you got to go to the oh you get up you get you get i did this the other day like i had meetings all day yesterday got up wasn't thinking ran out i'm like oh damn i forgot my bank card Oh, Got to come back. You know what I mean? It's kind of the same type of thing, uh, but just in the industry. But people get so emotionally attached, like, oh, it's like, OK, I agree. It's it's not ideal. But let's first ask how we got here, why we got here in order for us to find a solution to move forward. Right. Because just the solution is not like this is horrible. Stop it all. Well, that's not a solution. All right. Like first, in order to understand the problem, you got to go back to the how we got there, you know, and that's the way I look at things, right? Yeah, that is a very healthy approach. We got to dissect things and we got to slow down. So mm -hmm. obviously a lot of business systems are falling off a cliff these days. Everything is changing. All the things that could have been broken have been broken because there is a pathway towards something new. So there is a need for that bridge. And we haven't quite figured out how to build it. But in your experience, what has started to work already that we can at least look up into and get inspired? Something that has reliable uh, results that are inspiring and hopeful. Well, it, this change is going to come fast. It, it's funny because <laughs> change is absolutely inevitable. It's, it's going to happen, right? So you literally, you know, you things that you did at 16 are different than you did at 20 and the things you did at 25 or, and you know what I mean? And so on through your life. So you literally go through your whole life through change, right? Uh, kind of unexpected, but people by nature hate change. You know, it's, it's a very, it's a very weird paradox, right? So when you think about it, but that's just in your own little life, right? And in your own individual life. But now if you think of the exponential change with your own change in our own personal lives and this macro, more North American uh, mentality change, it's it's no wonder that people are confused, right? Like it, it's, and again, if you zoom out, you know, look a little bit more macro and kind of pretending like you're on a balcony of a, a large condo on the 30th floor, and just pretend you're looking at all the traffic and everybody else going around or a helicopter type of thing. Just zoom out and get that perspective and not be so focused here. Things become a lot more clear why people are confused and, and don't know how to pass and because they get too caught up in their stuff. But again, if you just look out and be like, why and how do we get here? It starts to make sense, right? And again, why is this, this train feel like it's driving to a brick wall? Well, it's because the baby boomers are about, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, a good percentage of them, based on their age today, will not be here by 20, 30, 35. A large percentage of them, of that population, are no longer going to be here. And now we have this problem of a gap, right? Because they're leaving and the young people coming in aren't quite old enough and have the skill sets to replace what's being left. So there's a big knowledge gap that's going to happen. And it becomes a very, how do you overcome that, right? Because there is no real good method, like before, as in, in previous generations in the world, there was a very direct line of passing down knowledge and information. But this time around, and it's more extreme, because obviously, we're we're dealing with the two largest populations in the history of mankind. But now we're dealing with the largest populations in the history of mankind with the largest communication disconnect in the middle in the mankind. I mean, with the transfer of knowledge, 
where most people learn by experience and hands on doing the majority of people, not the majority of people don't get concepts from reading a book or online. They can get the concepts, but the real world tangible experience of actually growing that crop or fixing that car or building that building, they need time in order to you know re refine those skills. And there just isn't the time and there isn't the, the, the transfer of knowledge to develop from knowledge to skill, right? It's just, it's just not going to happen within 10 years, right? Or 15 years. So now you have this even more strange paradox. And when you start looking at it through this lens, it's like everything looks a whole lot more clear why things are happening the way they are, right? Why is the U.S. border wide open? Okay, the U.S. border is wide open because even with the 40 million people they've rushed across the border, still does not replace the people, the baby boomers that have left. It's roughly 65 million people that have, have, have gone off, have passed away, right? And they've only brought in 40 million. So, but now you have a 15 million people gap that used to spend dollars in the economy before. So where do you find that many people in that short period of time? You don't, right? So what do you do? So you can't just lose 60 million people of your population, right? What do you think that does for the circular economy of day-to-day dollars floating in the economy or taxes or all those types of things right that so, is a very good point because everybody is looking at the immigration from the negative perspective but you just pointed out something that we actually are losing people at the rate at which we have not been prepared for so and the model of apprenticeship has not been in motion for a long time and people are choosing to have less and less children because of the high expenses it makes sense, right? Why do you have the high expenses, right? Because all of a sudden now you have less people, less buying. So if you own a store, right? Let's say you own a, like a, a clothing store, for example. And let's say five, six, seven years ago or eight years ago, you had lots of clients, right? You, you, your volume, your turnaround volume is high. Great. Well, now your overhead, right? Your percentage of, of overhead is covered off in the volume of sales. But now what happens if you're if what happens if you your overhead's fixed and your overhead also has inflation? Now your cost of goods have to go up to offset that cost of inflation, right? But then now if your sales fall off a cliff because people's mentality and wants and needs and solutions have changed, right? Not products. If you think in the terms of solutions, now you need to you, you need to increase the price of that product exponentially just, just to keep the lights on. And that's what's happening. So yeah. then, that, then, it becomes, then it just becomes this big spiral, right? Of everybody trying to hang on for dear life. And then the government's printing money and you're losing population. If you really think about it this way, like it makes a lot of sense. It's like quite an interesting puzzle we have uh, for us right now. And so being the, being an owner of the Joe Organics, what kind of solutions have this company been providing that have been working that at least may be a beginning of providing a bigger solutions on a grander scale? Well, it's, it's trying to incorporate the new with the old, right? Because you can't just come in and be like, Hey, what you guys have been doing for the last 100 years or 50 years doesn't work. And now you're going to do this. Why? Because human nature doesn't like change. So instead of trying to come in and force it down people's throats, especially in other countries where the cultural acceptance rate is, is different. Again, like we show them on a smaller scale and then we, we help them out in our germination facilities, right? We, we use grow towers, indoor grow facility towers, so we can germinate stuff a lot faster with a better quality seed and everything else like that. So like in the one here, we can do 15,000 plants a month, right? So we can we can supply farms with quality seedlings, right? So that we can increase, let's for say, for example, tomatoes take 120 days to grow or 120, 140 days to grow. But if I can grow those here in our germination facility for 30 days or 40 days and bring the plant, you know, a, a foot or two to the, to the farmer now, and then we can drop off you know, 20, 30,000 of those plants on his farm, put them right in the ground. Now we've increased his yield, right? We've shortened, we've shortened his growth cycle to get more, more crops off in a single year. So now he's inside, he's seeing this, he goes, wow, before I always get like two or three or possibly if he's really good four crops, but now we're getting five or six crops off because we can offset, we can offset the growth cycles, right? And they're like, 
okay, well now at that point, because it, they get incentive by the dollar value at the end of it, right? That makes sense. Oh, I see more revenue based on this model. That more revenue then turns around in inspiring them to make a change. You kind of have to go backwards. They're not going to come buy from you the solution if they don't know what the problem is. So how do you sell somebody? For you example, let's say there's something wrong with your car. But if you don't know there's something wrong with your car, and then I come around and try to sell you something, say, hey, this, there's something wrong with your car. And you're going to go, you're an idiot. There's nothing wrong with my car. Get out of here. You know what I'm saying? You're not, I'm not wasting my money on you. But if somebody came around and showed you, hey, look, at this is this is about to go or you could do this better. Oh, you'd be like, oh, OK. You know what I'm saying? Without no cost, without no no upfront money involved, not like trying to scam people type of thing. Right. So this is the disconnect. People are trying to sell them a solution that people don't even know what the problem is. So you have to address that angle from a different way. So education has to come first. The people Absolutely. need to be educated into into what is happening. And uh, what I've observed, so you moved from Canada to Latin America. And what I've observed in Canada, in North America in general, is that the farming and agriculture has included a lot of very expensive machinery. The, the mass produce uh, things that are part of agriculture require machinery that costs in the millions in the range oh, yeah. of that and the people require to take loans from the government in order to do that but when you move in into latin america uh, has there been a resistance towards this upfront cost to new technology which maybe they don't have uh, budgets or capacity or funds for yeah yeah there's a big resistance to that you know luckily like there's investors around the world that see that and and, and there's there's opportunity there. Governments understand that they understand the need, right? Because they, you know, they need, uh, they can't rely on the transportation industry or shipping industry to get stuff here and all the time. Like I'll give you an example, like, you know, in El Salvador, not too long, like a few, a few weeks ago or whatever, they had a lot of rain and flooding there and they bring a little most majority of their crops in from Guatemala and Costa Rica and some from Honduras. So, but since there was so much flooding and heavy rains, like they had 41 inches of rain in a day, in one day, which shut everything down. But since 100% of their, uh, well, I wouldn't say 100%, but I'd say a good 95% of their their uh, food production is imported. That's a big problem, especially in a crisis situation. So then the shelves were empty in the grocery stores, like fresh produce was out. So they, you know, they got to change that. They can't be so reliant on imports and a lot of other countries are going the same way right like if you look at what's going on with ukraine and all that where there was a major wheat supplier and grain supplier and now grain prices are going up right so you the centralized system was there and it's, it's, it's i'm not saying the centralized system is bad because you're able to get stuff in a timely manner but it, it went too far there's got to be a happy medium between centralized and self-sustainability so there's got to be a balance but this is all if you think about history it always works this way it goes from one extreme to the other extreme, and then it, then it comes down and finds a happy balance, and you're, you're good for 150 years. You know? And this kind of same thing happened after World War II. One extreme, massive extreme, and then we've had everything good since World War II, right? We've had a kind of a stable economy. Everybody's got their head on the straight. But now that we're having another population shift, we're going through these extremes. And again, it'll, it'll, it'll settle out probably by 2045, 2050, or and we'll think we'll get things balanced out and it'll be good for another hundred years, another another generation. But having said that, when in a world where everybody's so depressed and so confused, there's also an amazing amount of opportunity if you can just see it. Don't be so rigid. Open your mind. Look around. Do what whatever I can promise you this, whatever you care about or whatever you're interested in or whatever you're passionate about in life, I will almost guarantee you, you will find a market in Latin America, Central America, or Africa, or a place like India that wants that demand, right? Because they don't have it. They don't have it, right? So you're you're not reinventing the wheel. You're just bringing stuff that's already there. And if you're doing it because you care about it, it's not even, it's not even work. So I hear people all the time in North America, how do I get off the hamster wheel? How do I get off the hamster wheel? Get off it, right? Stop living in fear. Stop, stop 
um, having anxiety and whatever, right? Like it's not the end of the world. Honestly, like when I sold, like <laughs> when I sold my house in Canada and my property and, and I was cleaning out everything out for the final time, I had so much shit. It wasn't even funny. Like I literally, you know, those big garbage cans you get in the gar in the driveway with like 12 feet by eight feet wide or whatever. I must have filled four of those things of crap that I didn't even know I had. They were jammed in the garage, on shelves, like under stuff in the basement, the utility room, just, just shit. I like, I haven't touched in years. And then we had a small storage locker. And I think about this now. I'm like, why the hell did I even pay for the storage locker for months? And I think it was like, I don't know, maybe 200 bucks or 250 bucks a month or something stupid. But if you think about how long I paid for that storage locker to hold on to crap that I didn't even know it was in there, that money could have been allocated, even though it's not a lot, into something else, into some sort of growth. But we hang on to this, this crap in our lives, and it just adds more clutter, more confusion, more chaos. After I got rid of all that, I don't think I felt more in peace. Like I have left stuff now in my life than I've ever had for the last 46 years of my life. You know what I mean? So I moved out of there five, six years ago, right? So call it 40 years of my life or six years of my life. I've left, lived in less peace without having the need to have all this stuff. And then once you start feeling that way, you feel more in peace. Why does everything have to be so serious? And I think if people can just let go of that, their mind, their inner voice will come back. I think their inner voice is so suppressed with noise. People have forgot who they are and what they want. I always talk about how the inner voice is suppressed and how we don't hear ourselves and we're misaligned because it's like they say, the stuff you own owns you. So you just explain exactly what the life is like for the average North American person. They own a huge house. They buy a lot of stuff because they use it as a coping strategy mechanism to overcome the fact that they're not living their passion and their purpose. So they keep using this strategy of buying new things, attaching themselves to physical things, getting excitement from that. Meanwhile, they're stuck in a nine to five job that provides them the funds to buy all that stuff. And it's a never ending cycle, which does not allow them to hear that inner voice and actually follow what it is that their true passion is. And just like you said, if person would just activate that and they would direct it towards somewhere where there is a need for that, they would be much more fulfilled. But the fears, the fears are so huge in people, especially when they get to a certain point where they feel that they're established, they feel like they are, they've gotten somewhere, they are terrified of losing that because the unknown is the most difficult, the most scary part for a lot of people. So especially if they have a family, then they just feel stuck. I agree. And you know what they say, right? Like everything you ever wanted is directly on the other side of your greatest fear, right? You just got to take the step. And there's so, again, stop listening to the noise. Oh, it's so dangerous. You're going to die. Like, oh, Africa, there's nothing in Africa. Oh, I'm going to challenge anybody here right now to take a trip to Johannesburg. I can guarantee you, Johann the city of Johannesburg is more advanced, technically, ecologically advanced, beautiful, cleaner city than any city in Canada. Any. And they're like, I swear to God, if they got off in the city of Johannesburg in Africa, they'd be like, what? This is Africa? I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Like people are just like, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no cars. It's not true. You know what I mean? Oh, you're dangerous. You're going to get killed. Okay. Well, yeah, there's dangerous parts in the world, right? Like there's dangerous parts in Toronto. You're just not going to want to go to places in Toronto at three o'clock in the morning. Well, there's just places here. You're not want to go to at three o'clock in the morning too, right? It's, it's the same. It's just different. There's every country I've ever been to. There's places where you just like Dubai. Dubai is beautiful, but I can promise you there's places in Dubai. You're just not want to go at three o'clock in the morning. Right. And there's areas of Dubai where you're not going to go there and you're really not going to want to talk about women's rights there. Right. Like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but there are parts of that country. Once you get out of this little circle and start getting into the remote things, every, everything's not always as it seems. You know what I'm saying? And what I'm trying to say is stop listening to it and experience it. Go see it. If you if you think it, go see it with your own eyes. Don't rely on the opinions or thoughts or beliefs of others because it's not true. Right. You're getting fed a lot. You're being gaslighted a lot on the way things really are in other countries. Right? 
And if anybody on here listening to this or watching this, or if you have a, an idea or a thought that you want to go check something out, do it. Take a plane, take two weeks, take a, a week, take a weekend, take whatever it is, depending on where you're going to go, but do it and go see it for yourself. Don't listen to it. You know what I mean? And, and then, then make your decision and choice based on your own eyes and your own experiences, not from what you read or what's there. The most valuable thing on planet earth is time. Okay. I don't care how much money you have or you don't have, or how the job is, your career is, we all come into this world and we're all going to leave the world poor and penniless, no matter what it is we have. So if that's real, enjoy the ride, enjoy every day, try to make it the best you can to make a difference in the world. And you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes. I screw shit up all the time, but that's just, that's okay. Fail, learn from it, move on and do what you want because you can buy another house. You can buy another car. <clears throat> you can get married again. You, there's like, there's, there's nothing that's unovercomable, but I can promise you this with absolute certainty. You will never get that time back ever. So don't waste it. Absolutely. Mic drop. There's like no more conversation after this. It's it's so true because we don't even have to go far to exhibit that, to that idea that, con that there's misconceptions. There are plenty of people in United States that have misconceptions about Canada and it's only a couple of hours north. So imagine what kind of misconceptions exist about other countries um, mm -hmm. and the technical evolution that has been progressing at an exponential rate. And the countries have been implementing it in different ways across the globe. So to think that there are countries that are that are, don't have it or just not enough, it's uh, it's really a misconception. And the, the what I really love that you said is that, yes, time is precious. And now is the best time to really act because it seems like the world is it's ending anyway. It's the perfect anyway. time. It's the perfect time. And why do I say it's the perfect time? Because you're in the middle of the biggest change that's ever happened in the history of planet Earth. There is no point in time on the history of planet Earth and in the, in the history of human beings that we have had this largest change ever. So don't be intimidated by that. It's not your fault. Right. It's it's so grandioso. It's ridiculous. But you just have to step back and just take a breath. The sun will come up tomorrow. And the question then becomes, if that's true, we are going through the biggest change, which we absolutely are. How can we be part of making that change better? Because there's a massive disconnect. So there's endless opportunities in order to take advantage of that. I guess you can say in chaos, there's opportunities. Maybe that's a bad bad thing to say, but it's kind of true. If it's like, if you can understand it, you find the disconnect, then go and be part of the productive change. Be part of the solution, not the problem. And oh, the yes. more people that be part of the solution, the better this change will come about. And the millennials and new generation has the most innovative ideas because they have been born with technology essentially they've been born with phones and ipads in their hands so they are so perfectly set up for this evolution this revolution of whatever it is that we're doing that the only thing they have to do is just access that authenticity that creativity and divert it towards innovation based on the problems at hand and then we all benefit from it. So because from what it looks like, the world is already ending anyways. The climate is going who knows where. There is a politics, that there is conflicts. There's all kinds of issues. It seems like the world is ending anyway. So if it is ending, then might as well do what it is that you love doing, what you're passionate about and what your authentic self wants to do. And do the best that you can in the moments that you have left. And then maybe we get a new future. You know, the world's not ending. Uh, I think people seriously misunderstand or miscomprehend how robust and overcoming Mother Nature is. But for being in the agricultural industry, it surprises me almost every day what the power of Mother Nature can do and overcome you know, in a, an extremely short period of time. Um, and I know we think that we have a lot of issues with the climate and all the stuff with people in the world and all of that. And maybe, it, maybe we do. But what I, my, my, my advice would be that 
don't underestimate mother nature. It can take more than you can. It has a very unique way of evolving into something very robust, you know, and, and so will we, and so will we. And regarding that millennial thing, like I was going to point on a very classic example of that, because uh, a lot of older people are intimidated by that. And this is one of the key aspects that we leverage very much. No matter how good we are, technology is just moving so fast. It's impossible for anybody of our team to keep up on it. But we can we can bring these young people in that have that passion and that drive for technology. And we can couple it with people with experience and go, hey, how, how when we ask them, we don't tell them. We ask them, say, hey, how can you help us make this better? You know what I'm saying? And we listen and we try to implement and, you, and, they'll, and they'll come up with their ideas and, and then, then you start getting that passion in them. But I find a lot of people are like, oh, you guys know what you're talking about. This technology is horrible. But you got to relate to them on their level. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. They, they have a lot of potential. And so the businesses need to really start looking about integration, integration mm -hmm. of that new talent and being open minded. I think this is the biggest call for opening our minds and expanding our awareness towards more opportunities and possibilities in just our perception. So the more we look at the world and consider there's more possible, more than what we have considered in the past, more than what we have perceived in the past, then we can see how to incorporate more things and how to merge them together. Because everybody is right now tasked with evolving, just like nature can evolve. We are actually also nature. The birds are nature, the animals are nature, the humans humans are also nature. So we are interconnected with the nature and the agriculture. So we just need to better in correlate with it, I think, in in the in our attempts to harmonize with it, because we have been out of harmony for a long time, I think. And now we are presented with an opportunity to become more aligned with the true baseline of this existence. I agree. I totally and agree. so in so in your travels, what has been the biggest challenge that you have overcome since the start of this uh, Joe Organics company? Well, there's been a single monumental one that's pinnacle. It's just it's always just little things. You know what I mean? It's just stumbling blocks. You know, we come into places, uh, different parts of the world where there's not much information. People don't grow these types of crops here traditionally. There's temperature issues because it's a tropical climate and it's been growing in tropical climates is probably the most complicated growing area on planet Earth. Like it's very, it's very difficult. So, you know, we're re-engineering stuff, building new systems, beta testing new systems. It's basically trial and error because it's never been done for it, right? And there's, there's virtually no information on it. So we kind of just have to jump in with both feet and we're constantly tweaking and solving little issues and re-engineering stuff to to refine it for that area. On the same sense, it's exciting, right? It, 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 it seems daunting and it seems, I guess for most people, discouraging, right? I guess that's why most of them walk away. But if you can if you can be stuck worrying about the little tasks that you are overcoming and, and the little the problem they're in the grand scheme of things are problems, and those those failures are turning into successes and the amount of change that we're going to implement. That's amazing, right? Like if we can leave this world and have an impact on countries in agriculture, what more do you want in life? Really? Like that's you know, that's better than money, right? So absolutely. And I'm curious, why is it more difficult to grow in the tropical climates? because uh, there's just such temperature extreme, right? Like it could be 40, 45 degrees, 80 percent humidity. There are, well, what plants grow in 45 degrees or 105, 110 degree weather? You know, and then when it rains, it's not like rain. You get, you get 41 inches in a day. Well, how does a crop, how does a crop take 41 inches of rain? Like that's a lake, you know what I'm saying? In the 24 hour period. So there's such extremes that they, they try to come and bring their traditional concepts and their traditional machinery and traditional whatever. But you're trying to, you're trying to put a, a square peg of a round hole. So you have to do things differently. Why? Because you're in a different, different area. But when nobody else is doing that type of thing, then you, there's no data. There's no information. There's no many people have come and they've tried and then they just leave. But the, with the ability of technology and the cost of technology resources these days and the being globally connected, 
that we can have access to some of the best experts all over the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we have some partnerships with universities in Africa that help us and that help study us. The amount of, like, if you could, you put a problem out, like you can data gather, even with a, even with AI now. So you, da- you gather it with AI, just the team of robo- robust, intelligent people, engineers and people around the world that you can have access. If you put yourselves in the right group and forums and you start attracting the right people, the same types of mindsets, you'd be surprised. You put up an issue. I'm like, Hey, I'm having, what do you guys think about this issue? And like within 24 hours, you can have, thousands of replies from some of the smartest people on planet earth on how to engineer and solve that issue. Like it's on one sense, it's like we we're so disconnected from a personal information experience uh, in our lives, but on the same sense, the access to information has never been so readily available either. So my advice is leverage that, right? Leverage it. And that's what helps it, and this is what's helping us grow our company at an exponential rate. Cause it sure the hell isn't me. You know what I mean? Like I'm not doing this all by myself. I'm, I'm incentivizing others and mostly I'm uh, uh, trying to get incentivized younger people in technology and couple that with experience with some of our older guys. And, it, and that's probably the hardest part is incentivizing the older guys to get their head out of their ass and, and open their mind. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but that's, when you combine those two experience with the technology, you can make a lot of change in a very short period of time, but you have to be, you have to be open-minded to listen to both sides. You know what I'm saying? And that's, I think that's where the gap is closed. Mm. Yes. That is a very good point. Keeping an open mind sometimes can be a challenge. And I love everything that we have discussed. So if in summary, what is possible for an individual like yourself, for example, it's possible to leave a North American country where you had stuff and you had house and everything moved to Latin America where things are completely different. And it's possible to succeed in the exploration of your passion by just following that thread and being open to constant iteration and constant pivots and constant learning. It's possible for anybody out there if they just really stop and think and consider that what they are afraid of is not actually real and keeping the mind open to learning, gathering the data and collaborating with others, which is so much easier now because of technology. I think this is the exactly what uh, the world needs right now to just open the mind a little bit more Consider how many more opportunities there are that are probably invisible because we're just not looking there and start following that thread of spark of imagination. Yeah, I 100% agree. What's stopping them? Nothing. All they have to do is make a mental choice. So uh, all you have to do is, I'm not saying drop everything you're doing and sell everything and move. No, I wouldn't start. Like, that'd be the last thing I'd want to start with, right? Like, before I finally came and moved down here full time, like I, I came down here, I used to come down here for a month, you know what I mean? Uh, every year, like every February when it was cold in Canada, right? Like I got out of there and I came down here. So I did that for three, four years. So I didn't just get up and move. Like I just didn't like, I'm out. So I'd start there, just make the mental choice. You make the mental choice of like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And then you take action on it, right? Oh, you make the mental choice. So I'm going to get up and make a coffee. Then you take action on it. Right. So the only the only difference between getting on a plane and coming here is the exact same mental process of you getting up in the morning saying, I'm going to put the coffee maker on and make a coffee. And then you took action to do it. So what's the difference? I'm going to go to X, Y, Z. I'm going to go to El Salvador for two weeks. Right. Cost you five, six hundred dollars. Right. It's incredibly safe. It's got the most. Uh, North American feel compared to other Latin American cultures like Colombia or Peru or Ecuador. There's a, there's more of a, a cultural shock there. But if you wanted to come visit Ecuador or El Salvador for a couple of weeks, right? That's yeah. a, that, that'd, that'd be a great place to start. And it's it's cheap. You can do it and and just make that decision. Go for two weeks, right? Try it, right? And then maybe go back and after reflect on it. What did you like? What didn't you like? What did you enjoy? You know what I'm saying? You know? Absolutely. And that helps us actually bridge that gap that we talked about earlier. That mm-hmm. will then 
allow us to not let things fall off the cliff. It will create that bridge to the other side. It will merge things and incorporate them in much better way. So micro actions based on inspiration. And that is, that is everything. Everybody thinks it's always the big decisions in their life that make their overall outcome. You know what? It's not your big decisions every day. It's what you do every day. The little choices that you do every day, right? That's what is a collective of your life. So whatever choices you, the small choices, you know what I mean? Did I sleep into 11 o'clock or did I get at five o'clock and read a book? You know what I mean? Did I go to the bar and get hammered on a Friday night or... Did I have an argument with my wife? Like all these little choices is what leads to it. So just start, don't change the big choices. Just start changing the small ones. And then you'll the change will come, right? Take on, everybody's like, I have no money. Okay, well, if you have $100, well, instead of wasting $100 at a restaurant or $200 in a restaurant, especially in Canada, Toronto, say, I'm going to cook at home tonight. And I'm going to invest that $200 into something that, that's going to make me more money. $50, $20, $5. I don't care what it is. Just start. The sooner you start, the, the sooner you'll have an outcome. Right? Yeah, so, absolutely. That's, that's so, my so well said. Micro actions, a strategic kind of movement towards uh, something in the very small incremental steps. And that's all it is. So if yeah. anybody has been listening to that, there's been so much good information here that can allow you to move in a new direction that is aligned with who you truly are. And that will help the world in many, many different ways, including this shortage of labor that we just discussed at the beginning. So it's amazing. So in, in closing, is there anything else like we were talked about so much and you pretty much expressed your opinion but is there anything else that you want to talk about or mention about the agriculture and the food production and anything that is related to your company specifically i could talk for hours on that so i don't want to run this podcast to a 10-hour podcast but i want to thank you and appreciate the audience and uh but just in just i just want to encourage people there is opportunity. There is opportunity in agricultural. If people listening to them, that's their thing. Um, and if there's a, if there's something they, they have a skill or a resource or whatever, or something they want, please buy, reach out to us on our website at, at you know, sales at draworganics.com and, you know, offer your input, you know, like we're, we're not always doing everything right. And we're open to new suggestions. And I believe the more we listen and the more we can find solutions, the more we will find, solve our problems. So, you know, and I want to thank you for having us today. Beautifully said. I will add the links in the description below. And yes, if you have listened to this podcast, there are new opportunities existing in the agriculture business, and they are not the same as they used to be. There is uh, things are changing, and the technology is providing a new way for uh, people to get involved in their own way. So keep a uh, keep an open mind. Look for opportunities and uh, reach out to Joe Organics if you wish to. And with that, we'll close this podcast. I appreciate you. Thank you very much for being a guest. And thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your experience and your opinions and your vision. And it is all very, very inspiring. So thank you very much for everybody for listening and for watching. And we will see you next time. 